At the back there? Yep. <coughs> it's good. And Okay, good evening, and uh, thank you for coming this evening. I'm Isaac, I work with Li Hao, who's just uh, gone firm to look after his kids, my colleague, and Melinda, who organizes the Clojure Meetup at Flybot. We um, build games on Clojure. <coughs> so, uh, I'm originally from New Zealand. Uh, my lovely wife here is originally from Kenya. So we're both expats in Singapore. And um, one thing as expats and travelers that we often do is transfer money overseas or um, send money internationally. And uh, the next video kind of illustrates in a completely unrelated way <laughs> how I feel about that every time I come up against it. Uh, so this guy comes off the track and then he stands up his bike and runs along and then it doesn't go fast enough and he has to stand up at the end again and run along and then he gets back on the track and kabam <laughs> he's just like what <laughs> like, <laughs> why i'll play it one more time in case you missed that so it's can be really frustrating to send money and why because you can make a Skype call or a FaceTime call while I'm on the MRT um, and talk to my mum or dad in New Zealand um, on video in real time. But if I want to send the money, uh, I have to call the bank or go online through this long, complicated, multi-factor authentication process and write a lot of details out that aren't obvious, like Swift codes and account numbers and names and addresses. Um, write out these reasons for transferring money, which is understandable because, you know, we have, unfortunately, terrorism and crime these days. Um, but it's very complicated. It takes days to weeks. Uh, last time I sent money to New Zealand, it cost me $60 in fees, which is outrageous, in my opinion. Um, it says it's cost me that much. And it wasn't a lot of money, but I just need to send some money overseas. Uh, and you can't even check the status of your transaction. Like, you send it, and it just goes into a black box of the banks and you hope that it arrives and you've put in all the de details correctly, but there's no way you can go to see how long it's gonna take or um, if it's been completed successfully until the money just magically appears in your account on the other side. In my opinion, that's not the experience that uh, is on par with other things we have in the modern world. Um, it's an old technology. Uh, I think the banks have um, failed to innovate because they've been the key holders for a while and basically you know the system has got so painful to a point where it's actually restricting our ability to move forward in terms of the free flow of capital in terms of investment um, startups businesses um, doing trade in the world it's just too hard it should be as easy as perhaps sending email or chatting or making a video call. So who's heard of Bitcoin? Most people, yeah. So it's uh, the original cryptocurrency or blockchain. Um, I think about 2008 or 2009, I don't know my crypto history that well. So forgive me if I'm not entirely accurate. Uh, when the first Bitcoin transactions started occurring. And um, we don't really know who Satoshi is, the man who created it, but someone created it for a purpose, obviously. And it happens to solve this problem pretty well. That you can send money overseas, it's completely secure, no one can uh, debate that the money was or was not sent, and 
it's very fast compared to the old way of doing things. You know, I mean, Bitcoin's gone pretty slow these days in order of tens of minutes, but it's still much faster than the old way of doing things. Um, and you can see exactly what happened. I mean, there's a digital account that you can check up to the minute of what's occurring with the Bitcoins that are being transferred. Um, so it turns out that this concept of a blockchain, which is really, if you put it in real layman's terms, it's just like a Excel spreadsheet that you've shared with everyone who wants to verify that that Excel spreadsheet is the same as their copy um, and that everyone is broadcasting new rows to or new entries in the Excel spreadsheet to to everyone else who's participating all the time. So if you add a new row to that Excel spreadsheet, you tell everyone else about it and everyone verifies it. That's really a simplified version of what this blockchain concept is. It's, you could call it a distributed database um, or just a history of things that everyone agrees on you know, who's participating. And it's done in a cryptographic way, so it's signed, it's secure, it's guaranteed that that is the actual history. It turns out this concept of a blockchain where um, there's a verified, agreed history that is not verified by a third party is something really new and useful in its own right that's independent from Bitcoin. So before Bitcoin, if you wanted to verify any kind of information that other than just believing me when I gave it to you, you had to go to a third party. You had to go say, I gave you a piece of paper saying I um, transferred money to your account. If you wanted to really verify that that was true, you had to take it to the bank and say, is this transaction number correct? Is this actually a transaction on my account? Um, but after Bitcoin, we can do that now without the third party. So we can actually have two people directly agree that this thing has occurred and it's an immutable, verifiable piece of history. And that in itself has a wide ranging um, applications, not only in fintech and payments, but in everything from voting. Um, I mean, in Africa, for example, we have uh, unfortunately some very corrupt governments. Uh, so if we had a voting system based on blockchain, you could potentially eradicate voting fraud um, or any debate around who voted for who or how many votes there were. There's a lot of problems in Africa with counting of votes, with agreeing like on authenticated, uh, authenticity of voting papers and things like this nature. Um, you could raise capital in a different way. You'd record healthcare um, in terms of your health records or your um, prescriptions or where your drugs are supplied from um, in a reliable, authenticated way. Um, another problem uh, we've had in Africa is that uh, 80 to 90% of prescription drugs are counterfeit. So there's no verification of the supply chain into that market. Whereas if we put in a blockchain, you actually say, this is the drug that I've been prescribed. I'm not just taking some random concoction of chemicals. So some people believe this will usher in a fourth industrial revolution. Um, that is as significant as the steam engine that um, was part of the first industrial revolution or the um, digital and analog electronics that was part of the third industrial revolution, which is still ongoing. That's up for debate, but it's possibly an extremely disruptive technology to be able to um, have direct, free-flowing, verified information, just not, in, not only in finance, but in general, in, uh, in all areas of life. So just a disclaimer of the information I'm giving you. I'm not a financial advisor, and I'm not a, your financial advisor. Um, cryptocurrencies are highly speculative. You can lose money. It's a high-risk investment. So if you go and buy crypto after this, you know, do your own research. You know, it's, uh, I'll say a lot of stuff, but I'm just a guy who's passionate about crypto and programming. I'm, I don't really know anything. So <laughs> it's uh, important to check it out first. So I'm going to talk about the Stellar network. So Stellar describes itself as a distributed payments infrastructure and a distributed exchange of value. So that means you can send payments 
over a distributed network to someone else anywhere in the world and you can exchange arbitrary things for other things like say you've got oil and you want to exchange it for USD you can do that from different sides of the world on the Stellar distributed payments network. So say I want to send some euro to my friend, how does that actually work? So as we all know the internet is a distributed network, it has a lot of computers connected to it, phones, servers, and they all run your web servers, your, um, your game servers, everything that you connect to to achieve your tasks. So Stellar is exactly the same in that respect and that it has a distributed network of servers run by different uh, third parties who run the, maintain the Stellar network so that it's available for you to submit transactions or query transactions from. Um, the difference between having a central authority like a bank or a government and the Stellar network is that it's open source and it can be run by anyone. So instead of just being one authority that you're trusting, it's uh, thousands of um, completely independent um, organizations or individuals. So power is a distributed ledger. So that's what I've been saying before about the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, all a ledger is, is in accounting terms, is just have credits and debits. So um, you have an account, um, which is uniquely identified as you, and has a balance, which is made up of um, positive credits, and you're taking money out when you make payments to other people, and you add all those up, and you get a balance. Um, it also has other operations that it can record on the, on the ledger other than credits and debits, like it can record um, cre issuing offers for assets like oil or USD, uh, it can record um, trust lines like who you trust on the network in terms of if you trust uh, people to promote assets to you or if you trust people to buy assets from you. Um, can record different settings and options that are just part of the maintenance of the network itself and of your account. Um, for example, supports things that look like multi-signature wallets, so you can set options uh, that require a certain number of people to sign transactions out of an account. So those are all entries that go on the ledger of, um, of accounts for Stellar. And that ledger is distributed to all the servers participating in the Stellar network and then every server participating verifies it. And if there's any problem that's um, taken off and not doesn't become part of history, so you can't submit something that's fraudulent or incorrect uh, because it has to be signed by the correct um, participating people. So it's by a cryptographic key. So obviously, the system is more robust the more different people are running servers and also the more you trust those people who are running the servers. If the people running the servers um, can't be trusted then you can't trust the network. So uh, at the moment I think there's some hundreds of verif verifying nodes and there's thousands of read-only replicas. So there are quite a few different people. Um, Stellar has some very big partners who are participating in running nodes on the network, like IBM is using Stellar for uh, its global banking um, projects. Uh, Deloitte is using and uh, running Stellar is, uh, for payments and uh, auditing. So there's some very big um, conglomerates who are putting real commercial weight behind making sure that network's up to date running and secure. Sorry, does Stellar have miners as well? Sorry? Does Stellar have mining? mining? Uh, this is a very good question. So mining is like in Bitcoin where um, you prove that you've verified transactions uh, by doing a lot of cryptographic work and it takes a lot of computing power. Um, and you get a reward for that. Um, so, in Bitcoin, they claim that 
uh, part of what gives Bitcoin scarcity and inherent worth value. Stellar takes a different approach in that it's pre-mined. So they issue all the coins at the inception of the network. And then um, the scarcity just comes from the supply cap. Like there's a certain limit on supply cap of Stellar. Um, and the value comes from the utility of what Stellar provides rather than from uh, the act of mining something, so to speak. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. So, so if it was pre-mined, how it was distributed to people? So also a very good question. <laughs> so they tried to distribute some of it to existing Bitcoin holders and uh, I think a little bit to existing Ripple holders, which is another cryptocurrency. Um, that didn't play out very well, so they, I think, just have been giving it away in batches because um, I think only a small percentage of Bitcoin holders actually claimed it at the time. It wasn't worth much back then. It was like 2015 or 2016. Um, and the price has gone up a lot since then, but they, they haven't done that since. So now, now they've just given away some in, uh, to basically network participants like People who do remittance companies, people who want to do fiat exchanges, um, people who are contributing to the projects. Um, they've auctioned off some to exchanges to raise funds for their development. Um, so there's quite a few different ways they try and kind of spread it around. There's still a large supply that has not been distributed, which they say will be distributed uh, over the next 10 years to people who will most impact the growth of the network. So. Um, underbanked areas of the world, you know, and people would actually use it, need access to financial services. And also uh, people would be providing the apps for those services or providing um, development for the network. Who is the initial date? Sorry? Who is the initial date? The initial, what, sorry? Day. Day, like the first, the first stellar. First uh, I think it was 2015. I've not so been using so it for very initially, long. Initially, developers had all the points? Yeah, initially the Stellar Development Foundation, which is a separate entity to the Stellar Network, okay. who's responsible for promoting the technology. It's a non-profit. It's a non-profit, okay. yeah. So actually, if you know uh, Jed McCaleb, who founded Ripple, um, he's also, I think he did eDonkey back in the day, and um, Mt. Gox, which is a Bitcoin ex the first Bitcoin exchange, which he sold. Uh, he founded Ripple and then he left Ripple and then he founded Stellar and uh, founded the Stellar Development Foundation to promote the technology, which is a non-profit registered in the US. Yeah. But uh, it's mainly the commercial users like IBM and Deloitte who are, have a commercial interest in applying the technology who actually are drivers adoption, I think, um, through commercial use. Does that answer all the questions? So yeah. Uh, what's the incentive for uh, hosting a Stellar node? That's a good question. So the incentive is unlike Bitcoin and Ethereum where you don't mine and get rewards, uh, there's no payment for hosting a node. So you're not incentivized payment-wise. The incentive for hosting a node is around the utility. So if you're running a remittance company or you're running uh, a bank or someone who uses the network, then you run a node because it enables you to connect directly uh, to that local node to submit transactions and get information out of the ledger. Whereas if you don't have a local node, you have to connect to someone else's node, which means less reliability, um, slower, maybe perhaps quotas on the number of requests you can make. So the incentive is just in your own reliability of service, like in your own utility of using the Stellar Network to achieve what your business does. Yep. And uh, there's some big remittance companies and banks already looking at using it. Like for example, in uh, Asia Pacific, um, I think New Zealand, Australia, Fiji, and Indonesia are all going to be doing their international remittances uh, via the Stellar Network. So if there's any payments from New Zealand to Australia, it'll be going via Stellar. So that's a big deal. How would they handle the volatility of Stellar? 
That's also a good question. I'm not qualified to answer. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a problem with any highly volatile um, thing is that uh, if you agree to pay for something, when you send the payment, it could be worth a different amount to when you receive it. And um, I think you'd have to ask an economic, like someone who's like got an economics degree or something that question in terms of how they can stabilize. Uh, it, it's been remarkably stable just as a casual observation during the recent downtrends um, and days when most other currencies were going in the red, it was just sitting basically break even or a few percent in the green in terms of growth over 24 hours. So it has shown resilience so far, but I don't know what the drivers that are. So I don't know the technical side of things, but I'm pretty sure every remittance company has some sort of trading to, to fund their uh, channel. So, so I'm guessing that some, some human factor is in there. Yeah. I will say, uh, this is jumping a bit ahead, but you can also trade, like I mentioned before, you can trade assets on the Lumen network. So Lumens are the base currency, uh, which you pay fees in for transactions. But uh, you can issue any asset like oil or gold as a token. And that token represents a promise from the issuer to redeem that token for whatever it is, like gold. So if you've got a gold token and one gold equals one kg, you're trusting whoever's issued you that token that they'll give you a kg of gold when you turn up with a gold token or whatever. Maybe they held a contract that they've got gold locked away somewhere. But um, perhaps you could uh, trade tokens instead of the base currency would be one way not to have so much volatility because then that would be an agreed um, unit of value. But I, I don't know enough about it. How does that work? I mean, who verifies that I have a kilo of gold, let's say? You do. There has to be a consensus. No, uh, you trust the issuer to do that. So if you... you the member participants uh, confirm that, yes, we trust this person? Or? Yeah, that's your own business. That's not Stellar's. Function. All it does is verify that you got the token and that you got the token from uh, the person you think you got it from and that you paid for that token. It doesn't verify oh, what so the token means. So it's all off chain. Yeah. You have to agree between yourselves. Yeah, you have to agree between yourselves. You have just have to trust the person that you're getting it from. Like, say it's a OCBC or a major bank. So that you probably trust OCBC that if they give you a token, that it's going to be. Uh, redeemable. It can't be like that. It can't be like that. There must be a way to verify something. So this contract is somewhere off chain. Yeah, off chain. Yeah. That's not built for that purpose. I think there are some other projects that are built for that, but it's not what I'm uh, uh, going over this evening. That's a very good question. <laughs> um, so I'll go on. Uh, yeah, to just point out that that mechanism of agreeing is called consensus. So it's a stellar consensus protocol, which is how everyone agrees on the ledger. So an anchor in uh, stellar terminology is anyone who issues a token. So anyone can, who has an account on stellar network can be an anchor. And um, any token issuer is an anchor. So as soon as you issue a token, you become an anchor for that token. And in order to trade in a token, you have to establish a trust line with that anchor, which is a signed transaction on your own account that you've signed, that you trust that person to issue that token. So you can't just spam the network uh, like Ethereum ERC20 tokens and with random tokens like useless Ethereum token um, and have people see that on their wallet or uh, see that on the exchange or try to buy it. You have to explicitly actually go through a trust process. You establish this as something I'm interested in. Um, someone isn't just sending me spam and uh, I really do want to engage and trade for this asset from this person. So anchors determine the exchanges? 
Uh, anyone who chooses to make a sale of that token determines the exchange rate. So if you hold something and you sell it, you determine the rate because so it's what you will sell it for. Exchange rate, I mean between uh, USD and AKUD. Um, that's a good question. Let me get to that because I don't. I just want to answer it on the next slide. Yeah. So credit, say I'm paying USD to get my euro, which is your question. Uh, I go to an anchor or exchange I trust. I give them USD and they issue me a USD token on the blockchain and, re and return for that physical deposit. Maybe it's a bank transaction or maybe it's cash, doesn't matter. So now I have USD tokens on the blockchain. And I want to send those to euro. Now I can just create an offer on the Stellar network that I have USD and I want Euro. And that will go out onto what's called the Stellar Distributed Exchange. So it's an on-blockchain exchange. So uh, if you're familiar with cryptocurrencies, um, what happens at the moment is that there's central exchanges like uh, Binance or Bitrix, where you go and you create an account with a central party and you log in to their website and they have a database and a program running on their server that you conduct trades or exchanges between different currencies and different uh, cryptocurrencies um, in order to exchange one currency for another. Stellar's distributed in that you don't need that central server anymore. The exchange offer occurs on the blockchain, so it's actually on, on the ledger. You issue um, an offer to buy or sell something, and then anyone participating on the blockchain can uh, fulfill that offer. So the exchange uh, happens completely independent of a central um, exchange like uh, Binance or Bitrix. There's no need to transfer your money to an exchange wallet. You trade directly out of your native blockchain wallet um, for that asset to something else. How do they handle the liquidity of the ship? Like Okay, I want to trade USD for euros, but maybe there's nobody else in the network who wants to do the same. And my order just sits there for like weeks. That is a very real problem if you didn't have users. So luckily, um, there's some major remnants companies already committed to using the Stellar Network um, for, uh, um, I think in China, um, AUD, um, I think USD, Euro is already there. So they've already got existing customers because they're established businesses. So they have uh, existing cash flows going overseas and they're putting that on the Stellar Network. So they want to issue and redeem tokens for different currencies. But then they control the price. The market controls the price. But if it's just one or two big companies? Or yeah. who? It's a valid point, so I guess whoever has stock of trustworthy tokens, that is tokens that actually mean something, not just random spam, and on the network and want to engage in the market, control the price, depending on how much they have. You know, so if the more you participate, the more you control the price. Uh, but I mean, it's both buyers and sellers, right? Like if they just like, I hold all the USDs, so I'm going to set the price ridiculously high, um, no one's going to buy it. So then it won't work. So if they want to actually trade, they're going to have to set it at a price where someone will buy. But if there's some like some currency that nobody uses, and there's only one big provider, like one big uh, company that provides it, they can just set anything, right? Sorry, what was the question? Like if one? Yeah, if there's just one one kind of like asset that only one company controls. Then they'll get a competitor. They'll, yeah. yeah. they'll have some measure of control over the market, so but... there's enough participants in the market, they can just do whatever they want. Yeah, but you can't force people to buy something. Well, if you really want to sell. <laughs> yeah. <people> sell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, exactly. If you want to, you'll do it, but you have to agree. You know, you can't hold. So it's up to you to, 
or you can sell for something else. You know, maybe if you've got euro and you're trading for USD and uh, it's not going to work, maybe you go to Australian dollars instead. Um, but it's an interesting point. It's a challenge they're going to have to overcome. Uh, so what I'm talking about, the distributed exchanges. So we've got the USD and we want Euro. So Stellar has on blockchain multipath um, asset uh, transactions, which means it can go through multiple assets to get to the desired asset at the desired price or desired price range. Um, and it has atomic trades, which means all will succeed or none will succeed. So uh, for example, if the best way to get to Euro was via AUD, via another party on the network, it would automatically find that path through offers and buys um, to trade from uh, the USD to the AUD to the Euro. And the user actually sending Euro would never see that or participate in that um, exchange. They've just created an offer that says, I want Euro. Uh, and if it only got halfway, so for example, you, you know, that traded the USD for the AUD, but then for some reason the AUD never got traded for the Euro, it wouldn't complete, you wouldn't end up holding AUD. It would just all fail or all succeed for the complete multipath uh, exchange on the verified on the blockchain. This is not done like on a central server or on an uh, exchange like Binance. Um, so that's really the market that Stellar is trying to target is the payments infrastructure, that's what they call themselves, and um, asset trading and asset exchange. So when your friend actually gets the euro, they can go and redeem those tokens with a provider they hopefully trust for physical euros. I have another question. Sure. Not related to my previous one. Is there a way for Stellar Network to get information from the outside world somehow, or only these participants determine everything in the network? Do you mean like prices or? Like prices, yeah. Because these companies, they can kind of collude or uh, have some kind of agreements between themselves yeah. to keep the prices either too low or too high. It's a really good question. So, uh, can you get information from the outside world into the blockchain? No, but that's not really what you'd be trying to achieve because uh, the blockchain only handles the account of the transaction. So, the blockchain just says this transaction occurred at this price at this date between these two parties. It's a record. It's not a, um, you still have to interact with. Uh, a website or a, a mobile app or a server or something. It doesn't matter where it's running, whether it's your phone or a server, to actually submit that transaction to the blockchain. So that's just a general purpose program. So if you have an app that's running on your phone, it can do everything in the app. It could normally do it. It could go off and make requests to your own server that you control to um, get information about prices. It could make third-party API requests. I mean, if, if I were to use Stellar as an exchange network, then I would, I would like to, to, to have my prices be the market prices. Yeah. Not some random prices that somebody set or manipulated. So you mean when you sell your USD, yeah, like you'd like to sell it for the market price? Yeah, yeah so you could... So when you make that offer to sell USD, uh, that's code that I'll show you shortly that you would write in your choice programming language. So I've written it in Clojure. So in that, when you write that Clojure code, you could go and get the price from another source you trust, like xe.com or some other currency exchange website. Okay, so it's up to me, uh, so I have to do that myself. Yes, yeah, yeah, it doesn't provide that part. Yeah, but you're, you're free to get, uh, have all the, everything that's available to you with a general purpose programming language. You have that available when you submit offers to the Lumen Network. Yeah, it's very simple there. Don't try to provide more than uh, the accounting of the transaction. Yeah, cool. So why Stellar for this problem domain? Uh, I already mentioned probably it's fast, two to five seconds. Bitcoin and Ethereum 
uh, getting quite slow. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of CryptoKitties, but um, there was an app on Ethereum to trade cats, and um, it basically brought the whole network to a standstill. It can't scale because there was something like four to eight transactions a second worldwide. Um, physical cats? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was. I didn't get read too much into it. Was it physical cats or was it was it virtual cats? No, it's like a, it's, a, it's a token on the Ethereum network that's yeah. um, somehow um, every token is unique or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but is it redeemable for a real cat or is it just a virtual cat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All oh, right. So it was a game, apparently. I didn't even look into it in much depth, but it's pretty ridiculous. So what, what, uh, is it fast only because it doesn't have a long history, or? <laughs> That's a good question. So, you know, Ethereum used to be fast, right, a year ago. Uh, Stellar is fast because it, it, simple terms doesn't use proof of work. So you don't have to do mining to verify transactions. Just a small point, so yes. on the Bitcoin network, the propagation itself is also quite fast, but right. it's just in the memory pool of the nodes to get it confirmed, to get it inside the block. That's the yeah. long part. Yes, this is great. Yeah. Is also very yeah, thanks for um, pointing that out. So you're right, propagation on most blockchains is very fast, but the confirmations to actually verify that it's a real transaction and not a spam is very slow yeah and you know there's different solutions that may or may not play out like bitcoin lightning network and sharding and all sorts of things they're talking about but um i think for the domain of uh just sending payments overseas and trading assets on a distributed market where you want fast trades there's some value that a protocol like stellar can offer there regardless of how well scaling goes on Ethereum and Bitcoin. Um, the fees are really cheap. Um, like I mentioned before, IBM and um, Deloitte are involved. Um, they've got Stripe payments. Um, if you just go to their website, uh, they have... Uh, can't... Ah, oh, I have to press the exit to get out of there. Um, on the Stellar website, they've got um, their partners directory. So you can see anchors, they've got quite a few different. Uh, these are all remittance companies or payment gateways. So you've got like a bank in India, Sierra Leone, Uganda, Rwanda, Philippines, even Sendex in Singapore. Um, and you've got the quite some quite big payment uh, companies and consulting companies and IBM involved commercially. Um, when you say these companies are using Star, I mean, to what extent? Uh, so these anchors they're all using Stellar in order to conduct their transactions um, internationally. So, or using it in, um, in a large way for international remittances. Because to be an anchor, that's what it means, is to issue credit on the network and trade. Um, and distributed exchange, they've got hardware wallet support, which is this, this is a Legion Nano. Um, so you can put in a pin code here on the screen and unlock it. And the private key for your account actually never goes to the MacBook. I can even use it on like a Windows machine I don't trust or something, it's completely compromised. And I just sign the one transaction and the transaction gets sent to the Nano it signs it and then it sends back the signed transaction to the computer so my private key never leaves this device um, I don't even know my private key unless I tried to export it yes uh, it's cross-platform so it's just a Chrome um, app it's open source so you can run the Chrome apps on Linux Mac Windows and they're really easy to install they don't have a lot of dependencies so as long as you've got Google Chrome you can use it anyway you don't have to take your own machine with you uh, not all currencies have a support, Bitcoin, Ethereum, 
some other ones have it, but uh, a lot of the old coins don't have the Legend Nano support, so I found that really useful with Stella. So I'll just go over some of the basic concepts in Stella and show you in the repo um, how to use them with Clojure, I mean Clojure Meetup. So recently I wrote the uh, Clojure Stella SDK. It's, at the moment it's just wrapping the uh, Java and the JavaScript SDKs using CLJC. CLJC is the uh, file extension with Clojure that will compile both for uh, JavaScript Clojure script target and the Clojure JVM target. Um, so you can run the same code on a web browser and a Java server. Um, so eventually that might get ported over to some purely native Clojure code without Java or JavaScript dependencies. Um, I haven't got to that point yet. I'm just focusing on the Clojure interfaces and APIs, um, working out what those should look like, um, getting the user APIs correct. And once it's actually uh, usable and um, working well, then if there's some value proven and porting some of it over, I'll port it over. Otherwise, I'll just keep tracking the upstream dependencies. So for a Stellar account, you need a, what's called a key pair or a public and private key. So the public key is also your address. That's what you give to someone when you want to receive funds. It's just a long string of um, characters and digits. And private key is what you need to sign any changes to that account. So if you want to send money out of that account to someone else, or you want to change any of those options or establish trust lines like I was talking about, or offer an asset for sale from your account, all of those are operations that have to be signed by your private key. So you keep that secret and safe. I gotta keep mine on my hardware wallet. Or some people keep paper wallets, which literally they print out a piece of paper with their secret key and they don't keep it on their computer and that's their physical um, unhackable copy. So as I already mentioned, Lumens, a ticker symbol XLM is the native currency, but you can also trade um, other currencies as well. So we'll create an account so generate a random key pair, because you don't really care what your address is, and you need a matching private public key um, that you record somewhere safe, and you have to fund with a minimum balance of one XLM from another existing account. Just got some notes here so I can cheat and be a bit faster. It's just starting up a repo. Um, I'm using a boot build tool, and um, there's a plug in for that called boot tool steps, which uses the new tool depths alpha namespace of uh, Clojure 1.9 to resolve dependencies. Um, so it lets you keep your dependencies in a idiomatic separate file called depths.edn, which is like the Clojure 1.9 way of doing things. So I just have to run that plugin in order to resolve my dependencies. First, it looks like, um, It looks like this. So it's just uh, a depths map. And you specify the versions and any like uh, other properties over on the right in the map. So this is just depending on the Java SDK at the moment. Uh, so that might take a little while because I re last ran this on my iMac, <laughs> so <laughs> it's just downloading all the dependencies. Uh, apologies for that. Are there any questions in the meantime? Will the dependencies yeah, download? Which shell is that? Sorry? The shell that you're using. Ah, the ZSH. Yeah, but it's configured to look like fish, if you're familiar with the fish shell. Yeah, so it's um, cheating. It's a ZSH version that's got some hacks. <laughs> 
because I couldn't. I used a uh, normal uh, bash or ZSH for so long, like 20 years, that um, I could never get used to fish. So I just, but I liked some of the features. <laughs> so I just uh, that stole those. Uh, so this is the code I'm going to be running. Um, so there's a bunch of namespaces that are provided, um, like for working with accounts, key pairs, the network, um, creating options is to create uh, options, operations. Ah, oh, sweet, it's loaded. Payments and so on. So for generating a key pair, you need the key pair namespace, and then you can just run key pair random, and that'll give you a random uh, stellar key pair, which you can inspect with, um, if you want the account ID, oh, that's the same. That'll give you the public key string. So I've got a random one there, and then I've gener generated a random one again here, but this time I've just requested to get the public key portion, which is also known as the account ID, or you can get the secret seed. Uh, which looks like pretty much a similar string, but it's just a different um, string. And then you can also create a key pair from a seed. So if you are sending uh, money to someone, you need to provide a key pair, but you only need to provide the public portion of the key pair. So you can create a key pair from a public key, but it wouldn't be able to sign anything because it doesn't have a sec the secret key. It doesn't know the secret key. Uh, if you are signing any transactions, you need a key pair, but um, you need to create it from the secret because it needs to be able to sign for that account. So you need the secret and the public. But you only need to provide one, so you don't need to provide both the secret and the public string when you uh, create a key pair for signing. You just create the secret one, um, and it will automatically work out what the public key is. So you can just go key pair from secret seed, I think. And if I do that, then it will create the same key pair object that um, I just created randomly up here but I just copy and pasted the secret seed. So you can save that secret key somewhere and then recreate that key PA every time you need it. Uh, so these are some existing accounts that I've created. So you can get the balances. Of course, you need to require necessary namespace first, which is account. Yeah, and server. So you can see this account has only native uh, assets. So if it had other assets, it would um, return a collection um, with other asset types, but this only has a native, which is XLM or Lumens. Because um, it's a native asset, it doesn't have any asset code, and its balance is uh, 9.5k Lumens. Um, so that just returns as a map. Say you want to um, generate new account. If you're a friend called John, you'd define the key pair. So that's now John refers to a random key pair. Um, I'll just create some other existing accounts from Secret Seed. So this is an account, the account that I just uh, showed you the balance of. I'll call that Isaac. Um, and I'll put one for Sharon here. So 
So those are now three different key pairs. Um, so then I can call uh, count create and I pass in um, the source count, which is the account that's going to fund the new account with a minimum balance. Um, the target key pair, which is the John key pair that I created randomly. And a um, balance of lumens that I'm going to transfer from my account, Isaac, to John's account. So I can call it 100. Ah, so now it's told me I need to select a network. Um, so there's a difference between server and network. So a network is the blockchain. That's like um, actually the raw uh, transaction ledger. Whereas server is actually like a higher level API that you run on top of the blockchain. So there's, at the moment, you specify two connection points. You specify the network, like whether you're going to connect to uh, the public or the test network, which isn't real money and the um, server as well, which is the test or public, um, or maybe you're running your own local instance of the API server that runs on top of the blockchain. So I'll go use public. Um, and there's some other functions in there, like you can uh, inspect, I think, the passphrase of the current network. And it'll tell you that, oh, I want to use testnet actually, not public. Yeah, so now I'm on the right network. So it, uh, the network passphrase is just a string that identifies the current network that you're on. So I want to be on the test stellar development foundation network from September 2015. So now I can go back and I can do the create account again. And it'll take a while because it's actually going and creating the account. On the ledger, so that was success. And that is the transaction hash returned as a map. And closure. So you can take this transaction hash. And you can go to Still Laboratory. You can go to Endpoint Explorer. Transactions, single transaction. You can put the hash in here. Go submit. And here's the API endpoint of that transaction. Um, and you can see all the metadata about it, who signed it, so forth. There's also some more like uh, user-friendly GUIs, obviously, for seeing this information, like Stella Expert. Uh, the only problem with these is when doing a live demo, they lag behind about a minute or two, so I found out testing today that it wasn't going to be practical. But um, you can usually go in and see exactly the same information. Uh, given a transaction hash or an account, you can use this to view it in a more user-friendly way. Um, so we're up to, we're up to creating. So we can also do payments. So you can do a native payment, which is just a Lumen payment from me to this new account of 150 Lumens. And again, you have to remember to re require the namespaces. Uh, the payment namespace, which has some payments for assets and Lumens. Oh, sorry, some functions. Oh. That's interesting. I might have changed the API <laughs> of that since I wrote my notes. Ah, so you need to provide the server as well. So server testnet um, from source to destination and 150. So that's actually submitting uh, and signing a transaction between two accounts to the Stellar Ledger using the, those two predefined key pairs, the Isaac and John, and it's returned back a transaction hash. And again, you can go to the actual live uh, Stellar Lab and put that in and inspect 
that it has done and all the links to get more information. Uh, where is it? So if you go to this account, um, so it'd be keep here account ID of John. You can see that the balance of native is 250 because the initial fund was 100 and then I did another transaction for 150. So that's correct. Uh, so that's all pretty standard so far. It's not very exciting. Um, so I thought it got more interesting is for Stella, you actually have smart contracts. So this means you can have multi signature, you can have crowdfunding accounts, you can do escrow accounts, you can um, do time limited transactions. Um, you can do atomic multipath transactions. It all gets quite complicated, but I thought I'd do an example of crowdfunding. So say we're launching a new token for um, the closure meetup. We want to raise funds for pizza. I'm going to call it CLGA uh, SG. And you know, if useless Ethereum token made millions of dollars, you know, maybe we'll make some money. You never know. So you create because we don't trust people not going to spend all the money on pizza. We have to create a holding account. With, that we can um, issue the tokens from, receive the funds, and then we'll create multiple signatures on that holding account. So it's, we have two people who are trusted to withdraw the profits rather than just one person who'll run off with all the money and all the pizza. Um, so we have generated a new random holding account. Uh, the same thing, like I use an existing account to fund that account with XLM that I already hold and uh, Isaac keep here. So that's successful already. Um, now I can do a single transaction to add multiple signers to the account. So the copy and paste is a little bit buggy here with this large font size. So I just have to be careful. But um, so what's this do, what this is doing is, is submitting a transaction to the test net uh, on the holding account. And this vector is the set of operations. So the first operation is creating um, a set options with a signer key pair of me and a signer weight of one. So that's adding me as a signatory to the account with an arbitrary weight of one. Weight is only relative to other weights on the account. So if I have one and someone else has 100, obviously it doesn't mean much. But if I have one and someone else has one, it means we have equal uh, weights in order to sign for the account. So it's a relative, um, let's say, weighting or percentage if you add them all up. So also add Sharon, my wife is a signature on the account. And then I set another option, uh, which is different to those signer options, which is setting the master weight to zero. So this means that the holder or the holding key pair is the master key pair, because that's what created the original account, right? It's the private public key for that account. So that's the master key setting the weight to zero, which means you can't do anything on the account with that key anymore. It's just an address to send lumens to or assets to. It can't it has no authority to conduct any operations on the account anymore. One of these other signers has to conduct signing on behalf of the account. Now that would be fine, but either me or Sharon could do it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have to be both of us um, because I've added both as signers. So I also have to set some other options called thresholds. So there's low threshold, medium threshold, and high threshold. So thresholds are like how 
many signing um, signers do you need to conduct an operation on this account? And low, medium, and high, is, there's different operations that are predefined weights. So like sending, I think, um, money or establishing a trust line is like high threshold. Or um, there's some other things that you can do on the ledger that are low threshold because they're not like very much risk. Uh, so like cancelling an offer maybe or something like that. Um, but I don't remember off the top of my head what all the thresholds are, but you can just go on the documentation online on the Stellar website and it'll tell you what all the thresholds are for various operations. Ah, and again, I've forgotten the transaction namespace. Uh, I used to do a lot of Clojure Script, and in Clojure Script you can define a... Um, repl init function uh, and I used to like alias all my namespaces automatically on my repl init function but I haven't found out how to do that yet in boot so if anyone knows how to do that that would be really helpful because uh, it's quite inconvenient having to require them all one by one does anyone else here use the boot build system? no Linegan? Just, uh, yeah, everyone uses the line again. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, so it's all good now. That's submitting to the network to set some options. So success, and it's given a transaction hash that actually refers to the transaction on the ledger for setting those options for the account. And then lastly, you can start selling our crowdfunding round for CLGSG, CLJSG, sorry, the Closure Meetup Group. So we're submitting another transaction to the testnet um, from the holding account. Uh, this time we're creating an offer slash sell operation and we're selling a token called CLJSG for Closure Singapore Meetup. Um, the issuer is this holding account. It could be a different key pair, like the issuer of the token. Um, so for example, I can sell things that are issued by other people. I don't have to be the issuer and the seller at the same time. But in this case I am. So the issue uh, is specified separately. And uh, this is the quantity, so we'll sell a thousand tokens, quite a low supply cap, at two XLM, it's a bargain um, per piece. Just one moment. And then the last section uh, is the signers for this transaction. So if you look up here at the previous transaction call, there's nothing at the end. So this is a multi arity function. Um, it just defaults to the source account as the signer if you don't specify signers but if you do have a multi-sig account you can specify signers as a separate parameter as the last option which is um, just a vector of key pairs and the offer namespace of course we couldn't finish without one more no such namespace error Ah. So that is being submitted, so success. So now there is an offer on the testnet to uh, sell Closure Singapore tokens for 2XLM. And you could go buy those if you thought they were worth something. Uh, so this concept of smart contracts was actually thought up by um, can't pronounce that probably Nick Zabo in 1997. Um, basically, it just means a reliable way to encode the agreement around um, a digital contract. So 
Stellar supports smart contracts via um, multi-sigs and all the other things I already mentioned. As far as that definition is, is concerned, you can have digital contracts on the blockchain. Um, it's not, yes? Um, in the previous bit, you just asserted that those were the two signers. Yes. Basically. Yes. It doesn't really sound like sign. But secrets are also in the uh, environment. Ah, so do you mean in terms of... Uh, doesn't sound like signing in terms of that like, I held both keys yeah yeah exactly so in a normal scenario you wouldn't hold both keys right. but um, and you could uh, actually encode that transaction in what's called XDR format which is a like a text format and give it to the other person and they could load it and sign it separately oh, right. so but I kind of cheated because yeah, just yeah. over there, so it was the it was the fact that you had both of the keys yes. in your environment. Yeah. Right. Yes. Sorry for that. That's a very good point. Um, a good question is that I shouldn't. It's not really multi-signature if I am signing it with both keys. <laughs> but I'm just doing that for the purpose of demo because it's a meetup and uh, it's a complex system. But um, in a normal scenario, it would, you'd take longer and you'd have some means to share the transaction and both both sign it. Until it is executed on the ledger, it is just data shared between parties. Yes, correct. You can even uh, pre-sign a transaction offline for some smart smart contracts. And still, that's how they implement some so-called smart contracts. Uh, for more complex examples like escrow accounts, uh, you can pre-sign a transaction to get your money back, and then hold that offline and not submit it to the network because you don't actually want your money back until it fails. Um, so there are scenarios where you just hold a, tra a serialized transaction that's been signed by another party or you. It's a very good point. And that is the end of my slides. So thank you for listening to about Stella. Is there any other questions? Yes. Maybe not the difference, but why, why do you have to have the server and the network, like server uh, test server and test network? Yeah, so it's good. So why do you need server and network? So the way the Stellar architecture works is there's Stellar Core, which runs the consensus algorithm in the blockchain. So that's called the network. Like it's uh, either the, uh, that's what the passphrase first to like the Stellar public network, which is the live for money network, or the testnet, which is the STF testnet, which is just the fake, you can get funded for free um, network. Um, and for that, you, when you're submitting transactions, you're actually connecting directly to Stellar Core um, in some instances. That only does some low level things. When you want to, when I displayed uh, the endpoints on the Stellar Laboratory website, where it showed some JSON um, going into H from an HTTP endpoint. That's coming from a different server, Stellar called Horizon, which is actually um, a high-level API server that talks to Stellar So it uses Stellar as well, but it's a separate instance that runs, instead of just running the blockchain, it runs like high-level historical kind of account stuff. Um, it's not responsible for consensus. It doesn't involve, it's not involved in like making sure the ledger is verified or shared or anything like that. It's purely just a, like a convenience kind of uh, gateway to high level API functions. So that's called the server in Stellar SDKs. So I just followed the terminology they'd used in um, uh, the Java and the JavaScript SDKs because there are instances where uh, people might actually run a local Stellar Core node, but they won't run a Horizon service. They'll have to connect to the public uh, test or production server for Horizon, but they want to connect to a local ledger server like Stellar Core. And so for that, you can't really uh, put both the concepts in together or, or automate it um, because that's the way the architecture works, unfortunately. It's kind of an artifact of the implementation.
Yeah. Does that fully answer the question? Sweet. Any other questions? Okay, awesome, thanks. Um, if you're interested, I can just show one other thing, which is the actual Stellar Distributed Exchange. Because uh, we've still got a few minutes. Um, would you like to see that? I would like a GUI of it? Cool. So, this is a publicly available client called Stellar Term. You can either download it or run it on the website. Uh, so you can log in directly off the ledger. Uh, so there's different apps that come up on there. There's the Stella logo. You just hit both to open the Stella app on the LCD screen. And then you can click Ledger and click Sign In with Ledger. So this is actually signed in to my wallet on the Stella network. And even though it's a website and all that, I don't care if it's secure or not because I have to physically approve every transaction with a button on here. So you go to markets. So for example, there's um, SLT, which is a sustainable agricultural investment. Um, it's actually being audited by Deloitte. So uh, they invest in sustainable agriculture projects and they it's fully audited that they actually exist and the money is being invested in that agriculture so it's very verifiable in that respect in terms of an earlier question um, but it's off chain and that Deloitte's responsible for doing providing that information as an authority so if I want to go in here there's the buy offers and sell offers for SLT so you can currently, there's some people selling like, that's not even one SLT. So it's selling 0 0.04, like six SLT for 1.67. So I can go here and buy one like SLT. Oh, sorry, that's sell, buy. And then it'll ask me if I want to confirm this is creating an offer on the exchange to buy so ask me if I want to confirm on here. Sell XLM. So it says on here, sell XLM for this price for SLT. And hit the tick. And then it's successfully created an offer on the distributed exchange. And so this has come up down here as a current offer. And when that's fulfilled, there will just be no offers and my balance of uh, SLT will increase and my balance at XLM will decrease. You can see it's already partially fulfilled because I purchased one, but it's now down to 0 0.21. So it's someone partially filled it to 0 0.8, which is kind of weird to be honest, but <laughs> that's uh, what happened in a live demo. So, so that is live trading on uh, Stellar Distributed Exchange on blockchain. So like uh, there've been some problems with centralized exchanges recently, like uh, Binance went down for almost a week people's deposits were in Binance, they couldn't trade them, they couldn't utilize those assets or liquidity. Um, Is every, uh, this can't go down, every sorry. filling of the order gets recorded on the Yes, so everything, fulfilling an order or um, managing an offer, like creating an offer or canceling an offer are all entries on the ledger on the blockchain. Even this partial one here? Yes, yeah. Well, it's partial in the sense that I created an offer to buy, and then there's been subsequent transactions to fill it. So it doesn't like keep a running balance. It just adds it up over time. So there's so much information on the network, and it must be very big in size. It's about 35 gigabytes at the moment. Yeah. So it's, yes. Can you run a private network outside of the Stellar official ones? Absolutely, that's uh, a good and question. Does, and does it make sense and what are the applications? Yeah, so would you run a private network? Um, they actually advocate that, so it's a very good, good question because they uh, made the technology open source for everyone to use. Um, 
I think Deloitte actually do run a private network for internal use. Uh, I don't know what they use it for, but uh, the applications of that would be if you want to do any kind of um, asset or um, information record management, and that's small. Obviously, it's not made for like PDFs or like sound files. Um, and you didn't want to pay base fees, so you want to do a lot of them. Uh, you wanted to manage the service yourselves. You didn't care about it being widely distributed across a large number of nodes. Then you could just use it, take the server off the shelf, change the passphrase um, to your own passphrase, and run it internally on your own private network, and that would work. So, will, would IBM run a private network? Uh, from what I understand, IBM at the moment are using a public network because they actually run public network nodes. Okay. Some of the main, uh, some of the biggest public validating nodes are IBM nodes. And, and you have transaction fees, right? So yes. If you're running a private network, what, what happens to the fees? They would just get destroyed because the. The lumens are free in the first place if you're running a private network. You never paid for the the currency. Right. Yeah. Because you never bought it from anyone. You uh, bought it into existence, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. But fees just uh, get slowly destroyed over time. But there's so many lumens, so the supply cap is very high. I think it's um, so many billions, tens of billions. It will, you'd take like a hundred years to run out. So by that time we'll be using another blockchain. <laughs> Maybe in 10, 20 years we'll be using another blockchain. True. Sure. Um, yeah, any other questions or anything else you'd like to see about Stella? Or Clojure? Any questions about the Clojure library or how that was built? Cool. Oh, thanks everyone.